All right, let's jump into a deep dive, shall we? Today, we're headed underwater. Sounds fun. Nusa Panita. You heard right, it? Yeah, near Bali. Right. Exactly. Known for incredible biodiversity, but it's facing a problem. Uh, I'm guessing human impact. You got it. Coral reefs are taking a hit. That's sadly common. <laughs> What's the story here? Well, we're focusing on this project led by marine biologist um, Andrew Taylor. Okay, I'm familiar with some of his work, yeah. We've got all sorts of sources, project overviews, scientific reports, even firsthand accounts from folks involved. And I hear even some footage showing the reef over time. Five years worth. We'll get to that later. But our mission today is to, you know, really equip you, the listener, to understand not just the problems, but what this project is doing about it. The successes, the challenges, that sort of thing. Exactly. So first, got to set the scene. Nusa Panita, haven for marine life, popular tourist spot. Right away, you see the tension there. Yeah, that's the challenge. Incredible biodiversity trying to coexist with, well, all the pressures that come with us humans being around. Boat traffic, fishing, coastal development. All contributing to the decline of these reefs. It's not unique to Nusa Penita, sadly. And that brings us to the rubble fields. This isn't just an aesthetic issue. No, far from it. A healthy reef is this amazing structure, right? It provides food, shelter, everything. Right, complex ecosystem. But these rubble fields, unstable constantly yeah. shifting, currents moving them around. Makes it pretty hard for new coral to grow, I'd imagine. Like trying to build on sand, it just keeps eroding away. So huge problem. Where do you even begin to fix that? Well, that's where someone like Andrew Taylor comes in. He's not just a marine biologist, certified ecological restoration practitioner. Oh, so he brings a different perspective. Methodical approach. First, really understand the problem, what caused the degradation, has it been stopped, then you can tailor a restoration plan. Like based on what the reef USED to be like. Exactly. They chose a spot within the Nusa Penita Marine Protected Area, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that helps. Huge. Means those damaging activities, like bad fishing practices, they've mm -hmm. been addressed, gives restoration a chance to actually work. But it's not just about letting nature do its thing, right? They had a two-pronged approach physical and -E biological restoration. You can't just chuck some coral fragments on a rubble field and call it a day. You need to create a foundation. Okay, so walk us through that. Physical restoration first, what did it do? Several techniques. One was using this metal wire mesh, like a net almost. To hold the rubble together. Yep, traps it, creates a more stable surface, mm -hmm. allows natural binding agents to take hold, sponges, soft corals, that sort of thing. So they're kind of weaving this I don't know, a tapestry for life to cling to? Exactly. They also use these modular rebar frames, underwater scaffolding, basically. To give the coral something to attach to. Yep. Created stable structures, reduced erosion, and they strategically placed coral ropes too. Increased coverage, added complexity to the habitat. So it's like a massive underwater construction site. Pretty much. And once they had that foundation, it was time for the biological part, bringing the reef back to life. Now that's what I'm talking about. This is where it gets really interesting. Absolutely. But even that is super deliberate. It starts with choosing the right coral species. They had to think about what was dominant in nearby healthy reefs, which ones grew quickly to establish habitat, like Acropora corals. Oh yeah, branching corals known for being fast growers. Exactly. And they wanted species that would represent, you know, what the reef USCD to be like. It's like you can't just grab any old coral. It's got to be the right fit for the place. Right. They were clever with their sourcing, too. Used corals of opportunity. Corals of opportunity. What's that? Broken fragments that would have otherwise died. They collected and nurtured them, gave them a second chance. And they even set up a dedicated coral nursery. Like for baby corals. Yep. To grow fragments till they were ready for transplanting. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. But did all this actually pay off? I mean, did the reef come back? Oh, yeah. They had some amazing results. But as they monitored things, some interesting stuff happened. Some real surprises. Oh, like what? Well, for one, they found that single species coral clusters did better than the mixed one. Really? You'd think diversity would be better, right? Like a forest. You'd think mm -hmm. so. But they found that in those early stages of restoration, when things are still rough. Focusing on a few tough species first is better. It's like they establish a pioneer community, you know, paving the way for diversity later on. So it's not that diversity isn't important. It's about timing. Exactly. And they were always adapting their methods. Another thing they noticed was that they got better results when they focused on the edges of the impact zone. Where the rubble meets healthy coral. Why was that? They realized they could work with nature. 
by planting near the healthy edges. Those populations could spread naturally. Like gardening. Plant where conditions are good and they'll spread out. Plus, by stabilizing the rubble, they were making those conditions better. So smart. Working with nature, not against it. Exactly. But the real test, of course, is what happens to the whole ecosystem. Right. Did the fish and other creatures come back? That's what we'll dig into next. But let me just say, their findings were incredibly encouraging. Real signs of a thriving ecosystem coming back. They were looking at hard coral coverage, fish species, biodiversity, you name it. And what'd they find? The data from these reef check surveys, really encouraging. Significant increases across the board. So it's working. Life is coming back. It is. It's a testament to nature's resilience, but also to, you know, our ability to help things along. And this wasn't just a scientific project, right? There was a big community element, too. Oh, absolutely. Huge EE part of it. They knew that to really succeed, you got to have the local community on board. And it sounds like they went all out. Training programs, workshops, working with organizations like the Lombonga Marine Association. Became part of the fabric of New Sapanita, really. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. Ultimately, the community are the ones who will be looking after this restored reef. Exactly. They need the knowledge, the resources, everything to protect it long term. And it wasn't just about, you know, the practical stuff. They also created a scholarship program helping Indonesian women become dive masters and marine conservationists. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. Hitting multiple goals there. Gender equality in a field that's, let's face it, been pretty male dominated. Yeah, for sure. And ensuring that you've got these future generations, passionate, skilled, ready to carry on the work. Planting seeds for the future in more ways than one. I like that. And this project, it wasn't funded by some mega corporation, was it? Nope. Real grassroots effort. Donations, fundraising, volunteers putting in their time. Shows what you can do when people power drive things. And it shows that we don't always have to wait for governments or big institutions to act. We can get out there and do it ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we've heard a lot about the what and the how. Mm -hmm. But did they actually document this transformation, like, visually? Oh, yeah, they documented the whole thing and the before and after stuff. Yeah. Amazing. From what you've described, I bet it's pretty powerful stuff. You see these bleak, lifeless underwater scenes. Then five years later, bam, bursting with color, life everywhere. Got to see it to believe it, right? Pretty much. It's a testament to not just what nature can do, but what we can do working with it. Totally inspiring stuff. Yeah. But it also makes you wonder, you know, could this approach work elsewhere? Other reefs that are struggling. That's the million dollar question. And it's what we'll dig into in the next part of our deep dive. So can we replicate this? That's what everyone wants to know. Right. From one amazing project to saving all the reefs. Is that realistic? Well, it's not a magic formula, sadly. Every reef is unique. Different challenges, different species. But it does show it's possible. Yeah. Right. We can intervene and help. That's the key takeaway. It's not about just hoping for the best. We've got the knowledge, the tools. It's the will to act that we need now. And you think those images, the before and afters, yeah. those are key. They're more than just pretty pictures. They cut through all the science-y talk, speak to people's emotions. Show what's possible. Give us hope. Which is something we need a lot more of these days. Big time. Hope that we can turn things around, heal the damage we've caused. But it's not just about those big projects either. It's about our everyday choices too. Totally. Our own impact. Cutting back on plastic, choosing sustainable seafood, all that stuff matters. Absolutely. We're all connected to these ecosystems, whether we live by the coast or not. What happens over there affects us all. Nusa Panita, they rely on tourism. Right. And human impact is unavoidable. But they still made a difference. Shows we can have both. Development and a healthy environment. It's not an either -er. And the tourism industry, they have a big part to play, right? Imagine if everyone visiting Nusa Penita contributed to this effort. Dive operators, resorts, tourists themselves, the impact would be massive. So it's on all of us. Yeah. Businesses, individuals, we have to protect this planet. And it's not just some selfless thing either. Healthy environment means a healthy economy, a healthy society. It all comes back around. When we invest in nature, we're investing in ourselves, in our future. Powerful stuff. So... What can our listeners do? Where do we go from here? Well, first off, get informed. Learn about the challenges facing not just roofs, but all sorts of ecosystems. The more you understand, the more you can act. And there are tons of ways to get involved. Support groups like the Noosa Islands Restoration Project. Mm. Donate. Volunteer. Advocate for policies that protect the ocean. Even just talking to friends and family, raising awareness. Every little bit helps. 
And this story proves it's not too late. We can bring these places back. Just got to work together. Couldn't have said it better myself. This whole deep dive has been incredibly inspiring. Honestly, it's given me so much hope. And it shows me that even small things we do, they can make a difference. That's what we wanted you to take away from this. Don't underestimate your own power to change things. Get involved, stay informed, spread the word. We can create a better future for our oceans, for our planet. Couldn't agree more. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone. Catch you next time for another fascinating exploration.